Muy buenas tardes. Señoras y señores, sean todos ustedes bienvenidos al acto de inauguración del Encuentro Internacional. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you are very welcome to this event that uh, in the opening ceremony we are going to start at the moment. Uh, according to the order of the event, uh, at the first place, the first speaker is Juan Arroyo Marín, that is our professor of uh, botany in the University of Seville. Juan. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Uh, <coughs> the Honorable Rector of uh, the University of Seville, Honorable Deans of the Schools, distinguished uh, uh, guests, dear colleagues, good afternoon to everybody. I'm deeply uh, pleased to, to be with uh, all of you today on this uh, joyful occasion to celebrate uh, jointly the 14 MEDECOS and the 13 AEET conference next day uh, at the University of, of Seville. About uh, two years ago, some colleagues from the uh, University of Seville and the Spanish Higher Council for Scientific Research, led by Professor uh, uh, Monserrat Villa here, uh, were convinced by uh, our colleagues uh, at Olmue, Chile, during the 13th MEDECOS conference to organize the first MEDECOS uh, conference in Spain, just here in Seville. The reasons argued were strong, very strong, and they worked very well. We are here right, right now. Uh, we hope uh, uh, to accomplish uh, well the task uh, that was uh, assigned to us. When uh, ISOMED, the International uh, uh, Society for Mediterranean Ecology, and uh, its regular conferences, MEDECOS, were founded in, uh, during the early 70s, uh, past uh, century, modern terrestrial ecology in Spain was in, in uh, its infancy. By then, the Spanish uh, presence in, in that forum was little. In fact, AET, uh, the Spanish Association for Terrestrial Ecology, was founded much later, although uh, it gained uh, relevance rapidly. Uh, we can say that uh, today, currently, we uh, and our Portuguese uh, colleagues have done uh, the job. And the region with probably the largest uh, continuous territory of Mediterranean climate Uh, the Iberian Peninsula has a healthy uh, scientific community devoted to Mediterranean uh, topics. Uh, despite that this uh, seems uh, a rather regional definition of uh, our science, it has been increasingly evident that the topics we are interested uh, in <coughs> are more and more relevant for uh, world-scale issues. This is probably, uh, probably a consequence uh, of our intermediate latitude and also populated territories, which uh, make us more and more sensitive to global change. In addition to interest in these mostly ecological issues, by definition, evolution <coughs> was immersed in this research program from the very start of the Mediterranean uh, scholar community. It is fair, <coughs> it's fair to mention the influence that the paper by the, uh, uh, Peter Raven, The Evolution of Mediterranean Floras, written in, in 73, had uh, a very strong, uh, as I said, influence in my uh, generation. Uh, since then, this field has undergone a method, 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 <coughs> excuse me, methodological revolution, and uh, there is a sound <coughs> uh, evolutionary research made uh, here in Spain and in other Mediterranean countries. So uh, time is ripe to develop uh, these topics in the, in the conference. It can be told similarly about evolutionary ecology, a sound topic in Spain too. At the same time, we don't forget our, our colleagues from other Mediterranean regions who uh, made so remarkable contribution to, uh, to Mediterranean ecology. Thus, uh, we made a program of uh, invited lectures trying to balance both topics and regions. 
uh, about uh, 16 people in the organizing committee and 30, yeah, 30 volunteer uh, students, mostly PhD students and postdocs from the University of Seville, several institutes uh, of the Spanish Higher Council for Re Scientific Research and universities, uh, Pablo de Olavide and Cadiz University, have been working hard to make easy the event for you. Our invited speaker, uh, all, all of them accepted immediately to join and share with us uh, their immense knowledge uh, in different fields, despite that they, their very busy schedule. We thank uh, the Severo Ochoa program of the Ministry of Economy, the Spanish Ministry of Economy, for financial su uh, support for that. <coughs> Uh, this conference uh, will be developed in three of our university schools and one research building. We are very grateful to the deans and directors for the many facilities that uh, they provided, and especially uh, the vice rector for research, uh, who put all the possible effor effort uh, on that. We deeply thank all of them for this. Everything is thus, is thus prepared. Now is uh, your turn. Let's uh, show and learn a good science, which is what uh, we all uh, enjoy. And let's uh, translate it properly to the society. It's our responsibility, and probably more than ever before. Uh, on behalf, just to finish, on behalf of uh, the organizing committee, welcome to the 14 MEDECOS and the 13 AEET conference, where we hope uh, you can have plenty of uh, mutualistic interactions uh, paraphrasing our ecological terminology, you know, which finally is the main reason to come here. Thanks uh, for coming. Thank you very much, Professor Juan, my friend. Now, Francisco Lloret, on behalf of the uh, Spanish Association of Ecological Systems, Thanks. Uh, rector and vice-rectores y deganos, señoras, señores, uh, on the behalf of the Association of Ecology, Terrestrial Ecology of Spain, uh, let me thank very strongly, very firmly, the uh, institutions as the University of Sevilla and FESIC and Estación Biológica Doñana that have been worked very, very much, very strongly to to allow us to meet here in this uh, in these sessions. So this is my first idea, just to thank them, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the Association for e Terrestrial Ecology, uh, Spanish uh, Spanish Association for Terrestrial Ecologies, is a, is a scientific society with about 800 people, 50. 250 of them are students, so we are very proud that this is a quite young society and very active in, in the sense of the, uh, the scientific value. And we have several challenges to, to move on, and we will, we will deal with, with that in the, in the meeting. But um, let me explain that we, we normally, we usually regularly meet every two years, yes, as many other societies, to exchange our experience and to know each other much better and strengthen their relationships, because the human relationship is very important for, for anything, and, but also for science. Science is not just a cold thing. It's based in the human quality, and we need to strengthen our, each other knowledge. But we are also used to, to meet with another societies very often with the European, the European Federation for Ecological Societies, with our colleagues of Portugal, with the Society for Ecological, Portuguese uh, Society for Ecology. And now is the time to, to meet together with, with our colleagues from other Mediterranean areas, and that is representative of the ISOMED organization, and the MEDECOS is the, the very nice number, name of this, uh, of this regular meeting. So we are very proud to, to, to converge, to merge in, in, this, uh, in, this meeting, uh, in this meeting with them. In fact, it, that was for us as a society our main goals when we decided to, to propose Sevilla as the place to do this meeting for two main reasons. Because that was an opportunity to our members of the, our society to get in contact with colleagues abroad 
and to have this international meeting, this international point of, of, of meet with, with other colleagues. This is one side. But the other side is because we think that for the international community, the scientific community of ecologists, uh, also to provide opportunity to meet with the ecology, or the ecologists that here in Spain we are working. Because we think that the level of our science or our ecology is very good, it's excellent. So I, we had both big reasons to meet together. Uh, and the number of people, the, 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 the apparent quality of the many communication that will, that will cross uh, during these days seems to, to say that the, this goal will be attained. Let's say what happens anyway. Um, <clears throat> Ecology is, is, is a complex science. It's a complex science because it deals with, with, with biological systems that themselves are quite complex, very complex when you put all together. It's complex because the environmental, the non-biological environmental is complex, and we can see this just with the case of the climate and the context of climate change we have. So it's real, it's real. Uh, uh, a discipline and, and science that, that it's, it's difficult. Um, and we deal with many, with many concepts and we, and we try to, to be very, very, very firm, very strong with our conclusions by doing well replicated experiments, large data analysis and so on. But this is not only, what is important I think for ecology is not this science as a real science, but also is because this is a science that has a clear correspondence for the needs of the society. So we cannot stop here in our tower and our laboratory and our field station taking information. We need to transmit this information to the society because the society, in this is a kind of trans transversal knowledge from the very local problems to the global problems. So we should be there, and you, we should be able to transmit our knowledge to the needs of the society. Um, I'm not going to, to talk much more longer. There are many people, and what is important here is the scientific communication. So yes, uh, thank you very much to stay here and enjoy science. Thank you very much, Francisco. Now, Dr. Philip Randall, on behalf of the International Society for Mediterranean Ecology, has the turn. Bienvenidos a todos. Uh, it's very nice to be here, and we're very appreciative of the organizers and the uh, AAT to help organize this together with the uh, Medicos group. Uh, as was mentioned, Medicos has been around since 1971. Uh, some of you know Hal Mooney, who was very successful in the early days he organized the first two meetings, 1971 in Valdivia in Chile, 1976 in Stanford University. And generally there's been a theme each time. Uh, ISOMED was an organization set up uh, some years ago to try to promote a continuation. Uh, now that these meetings have been going on for more than 40 years, it's really important to get younger people involved, to get a new generation, uh, to, re to reproduce ourselves in terms of the focus on Mediterranean ecology. Um, by my calculations, this is the fourth time we've met in the Mediterranean basin, three times in California, um, three times in Chile, twice in South Africa, and twice in southwestern Australia. So it's, it's been a really interesting ride over these years to see the, the uh, number of interactions and collaborations that are developed. I've been to all of them except the 1971 meeting, so I think I have the record of the most attendee, best attendee. And from the simple meetings with a smaller number of people coming and some good studies, some fairly unsophisticated studies, I think we've seen a remarkable advancement in Mediterranean ecology, and I think you'll see that in William Bond's talk coming up later. We have some of the top scientists in the world now working on Mediterranean ecology, and I think that's really important collaborations between the regions started with the very early meetings and now I have co-authors in all four regions besides my own in California that I work together with 
I think this is the, really the crux. So ISOMATE is a very loosely organized uh, uh, a group, but trying to promote and other, other uh, kinds of interests to broaden our meeting, to continue the meetings, to find that new blood. Um, the, uh, we'll have some discussions about the next meeting coming up. It'll be in, in usually Medicos meetings are every two or three years, around the world occasionally four, but we're aiming for the next time. Uh, at the last meeting, which was in Chile two and a half years ago, uh, several of us made some very subtle, extremely subtle hints that Sevilla would be a very nice place to have a meeting. And we're very pleased that everyone came through, and it's, I think we're all very happy to be here. So thank you very much to the organizing committee and the university. Thank you very much, Dr. Randall. Now, Joaquin Cerda Sureda, director of the La Estación Biológica de Doñana, has the word. Thank you. Well, uh, first, uh, I want to thank, uh, to personalize the, the, the thanks, not only to the university to hold uh, this uh, uh, Congress, but also to Juan Arroyo and Monsevilla that are we so bold to organize this World Congress. Uh, just a few minutes ago, when we were discussing with Susan and, and uh, Sharon, they were explaining the, that the, the Ecological Society of America, they have uh, 5,000 people in the Congress. For us, uh, 500 people like this Congress is really a World Congress, a very big Congress. And I must thank Juan and Monse because they have been a lot of, of work. Uh, well, let me to, to explain, mainly for the foreigners, uh, what we are. What is uh, the Doñana Biological Station? Uh, because, uh, well, we, despite our name, we are not a field station, or we are not only a field station. Uh, we are a public research institute belonging to the Spanish National Research uh, Council, CSIC, in the area of natural resources. And uh, we don't belong to, to the university, but we are working in uh, close collaboration with the University of Sevilla and also with the University Pablo de Olavide in Sevilla. But we are independent, we are only a research institute. Uh, <clears throat> we have a big facility with a field station in Doñana National Park, another facility in the Andalusian Mountains, in a, it's a very isolated uh, house in the Sierra de Cazorla, and our central labs and offices are here in Sevilla. Uh, however, our researchers do field work uh, all over the world, not only in Doñana, but at the beginning we were working in Doñana and later we expand around the world. Uh, our mission as a research institute is to carry out uh, multidisciplinary ecological research to understand within the framework of the evolutionary theory the way in which biodiversity is generated, maintained, and how it deteriorates, as well as its conservation and restoration. These two things probably they are the needs that uh, society asks for. Uh, we have been awarded a Center of Excellence by the Severo Ochoa program of the Spanish Ministry of Economy, and now uh, we thank them also to partially fund this uh, Congress. But, well, I think that you are here <coughs> to, to listen to the interesting opening conference of William Bond and also the scientific uh, season, uh, sessions, and I expect that you will enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear director. Uh, let me tell you some uh, very few words uh, before declaring officially inaugurated this conference. Uh, in order to, to, to do the formal things uh, we used to, to do in this kind of ceremonies. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to welcome you to our university, uh, to the town of Sevilla. Uh, from now, I hope uh, all of you can consider us your town. It's a pleasure for me uh, to host this workshop 
in our university, and I would like to thank you very much for deciding this act. But first of all, um, before telling the formal words, I'd like to tell you that I am an inorganic chemist, and I have been working for a long time, for more than half of my life, uh, studying the structure of the matter um, in accordance with the structure the matter has, with the reactivity the matter has, but without life. And now, I think, uh, in this ceremony, I would like to tell you that uh, it's very important what you are doing because you put life in all the things you are looking at. And this is one thing it lacks in my research, in my investigation, and I think it's the soul of all the very important things of the life. Thank you for working in these kind of things. Uh, after that, and now coming back to the former things, uh, let me tell you that I would like to acknowledge the following individual people that has uh, achieved that this ceremony is now a real thing. First of all, to the conference chairs, to my friend Juan Arroyo and Montserrat Vila from the Doñana Biological Station. Next, to the local organizing committee, which have the participation of researchers from Doñana Biological Station, from the INA, from the University, Rey Juan Carlos, Cadiz, Pablo de Olavide, of course, our sister university, Pablo de Olavide, and a special gratitude to the professor of our staff, Montserrat Arista, from our university, Marcial Scudero, and Susana Redondo, my good friend and my dear colleague. The International Advisory Committee and Scientific Committee with researchers from institutions from Australia, Chile, Greece, Portugal, South Africa, USA, France, and Germany. And of course, from the Spanish Ecological Society Board. Thanks for choosing the University of Sevilla for the conference, as we are very committed to promoting research and its visibility. I would like to remark on the importance on the celebration of meetings for the scientific community. They are essential tools for the debate, for the discussion, and for the production of good science. But also, I have to say that they are relevant events for us, the hosting institution, our university, since they contribute to promote research inside and outside their university, and we all agree that research High quality research is essential for the university and, of course, for the society. The topics of this conference are very relevant for science and for the society. The main focus of the joint conference is the ecology and the evolution of Mediterranean ecosystem and their species, from plants to animals and also microorganisms. With this conference, we will gain insight into the similarities and differences in how Mediterranean type ecosystem function, change and evolve due to the human activity. The conference covers many topics with 10 invited lectures from world-class specialists and more than 20 symposia led by first-line ecologists. After the sessions and after the symposia, three field trips are also organized. New information will be presented on the environmental impacts of global change not just climate change or forest fires, but also the destruction of habitat, of inventions by exotic species, or the excessive fertilization of ecosystems. After the rainforest, the regions with the Mediterranean climates are the ones with the greatest diversity of vascular plants. They represent only 2% of the world's surface. About one in six plant species in this world is present only in the small area of these five Mediterranean climate ecosystems, what make them globally significant biodiversity critical points, as Phil Randall, professor of the University of California, explains. Conferences like this one can positively contrib contribute to learning how resilient or vulnerable our plants are other organisms that depend on them will bat at the fast and unprecedented climatic ambience. The conference will also host a regular Spanish Ecological Society meeting, a scientific society founded in 1989, and that has over 700 members, or 800 members, I think. Also, 
the choice of this scenario is clearly adequate. The University of Sevilla, our university, is very active and internationally recognized in research. The School of Biology represents a long-standing tradition of natural history studies dating back to the century uh, 18th and 19th. The school currently offers bachelor degrees in biology and biochemistry, master degree in advanced biology, and a PhD program in integrative biology. In particular, the Department of Plant Biology and the Department of Ecology of the Faculty of Biology of the University of Seville our dean is with us in this table at the moment, have been dedicated to the study of the origin and to the extinction of Mediterranean plants. Through these studies, we will be better able to understand how they will react to the changes that are taking place and those that are foreign in the not to distant future, as explained many times Professor Juan Arroyo. I would like also to introduce my institution my university that now is our university with some data that can help you to calibrate the dimension of the university of our dear Seville. We have about 65,000 students. Our academic staff is over 4,000 lecturers and researchers which form 550 research groups included in 135 departments. The University of Seville host seven large research facilities operated in cooperation with other research institutions. We have 15 general research services that give support to the investigation of our groups and those from other universities and research institutions, providing as well high standard services to private companies. 40 million euros in research infrastructure in the last 10 years. Some last word for the participants in general. Firstly, thank you very much for coming. You all enhance the quality of the meeting. And secondly, take advantage of the meeting and all the science you are going to deal with. I invite you to a strong debate, which is the way that will lead to the good ideas. And finally, and thirdly, enjoy the conference, of course, but enjoy the city. Thank you very much for your attention. Now, now I think that the formal thing hopefully has finished, and now the science starts to uh, grow here. So now we go down, and the first lecture is going to start. Thank you. Now can you hear me? Uh, I've known William Bond for more years than either of us like to think about it. I first met William more than 30 years ago. Um, he has a history with my institution, UCLA in Los Angeles. Uh, William was, got his PhD in my department, the same department that Hal Mooney was in when he conceived the idea of Medicos. And William really follows in the line of a lot of really top uh, plant biologists and ecologists that have come out of my department the first of being Peter Raven was a grad student in that department, and William really follows very nicely on the history of Peter Raven. Um, William has a history of being what you can call an information sponge. Anything he hears about from any field, he just sucks it in and then comes out with really innovative ideas. I think the genius of William in the research that he's done is taking problems that we're all aware of and finding really innovative ways to deal with those things. He, a lot of his research just needs a meter stick. It doesn't need a lot of fancy instrumentation. Uh, he's incredibly productive in what he's done. And he's really had a huge impact 
in Mediterranean ecosystem work in terms of uh, fire as a, a global uh, herbivore. He's had a major influence on savanna and grassland ecosystems in the work that he's done. Uh, one example of William's really interest in getting information out to more people, uh, I remember in the 1994 Medicos meeting in Chile, William came and he took a lot of the South African colleagues out on a field trip, collected a lot of plants, and then came back to the hotel and passed them around explaining what they were. One of the plants he passed around to all to handle was Lutrea caustica, an anacardiaceae that causes a horrible skin rash. Um, but William has a, is a great source of information in terms of his uh, bona fides and for being here today. He is now an emeritus professor at the University of Cape Town, where he formerly held the Harry Bolas Chair in Botany. He's the head now of SEON, a long-term ecological research uh, group, South African Environmental Observation Network, which is doing research in Feinbos ecosystems. Uh, he has many, many uh, fingers out in, in a variety of ecosystem areas, but he's really uh, an important person in our field. So William, without further ado, Does this, does this work? Whoa. Okay, I'm now frozen next to the microphone, which is great. Um, and to advance the slides, I just put this. And to start, Espanol. Por favor. <laughs> How do I get this bloody thing going? Sorry, it's all in Spanish. Um. Uh. I first came to Spain in the 19, late 1960s, and uh, I love the country, and I, uh, all the visits I've had since have been fantastic. I've had uh, deep admiration for the ecological tradition in Spain. I owned a book by Margalef uh, from the 1960s, and ever since I've seen the expansion of uh, Spanish ecological thinking and uh, activity. So it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. And I feel a bit of a fraud at a Medicos meeting, because I haven't worked on many Mediterranean systems uh, very much and with it until uh, a little bit recently. So, that's what I want to talk about, is um, the biomes of the world. If you look at a, a satellite map, looking down, the world is different colors. And um, we now are trying to understand why we have these different colors, the different nature of biomes around the world. If you look at Africa, it's uh, a lot of yellows and browns, and that reflects grasslands. Even where it's relatively green, these are woodlands with uh, grassy understory. And it's the only large set of tropical forest is, uh, sits there. But uh, down here, in this tiny little fraction of the Cape, things are different. And South Africa is a, an extremely interesting country for a biologist. It has nine different biomes, where a biome is defined by major growth forms that dominate and that are different in each distinct biome. Uh, and these ones down here, I hope you can, yeah, all right. Uh, these um, ones down here are in the winter rainfall parts of the country, not necessarily Mediterranean climate, but where there's substantial winter rainfall. And that's unlike the rest of Africa. So Polis, a brilliant ecologist uh, who died tragically young, commented he was confronting the idea that the, the world is green because of predators, the Hairston Smith and Slobodkin idea. And he said, you know, come off it. The distribution of biomes reflects the broad and overpowering influence of climate. Let's get real on this lot. Um, and the distribution of biomass and so on is all about climate. And in striking contrast to that, in an influential uh, book, Turborg and Estes said, 
Their purpose, their, what they want to do is to elevate biotic forcing in ecology as co-equal with physical forcing. So it's not all about climate. It's at least as much about the organisms themselves and what they're doing and how they're constructing things. So we need to be very aware of that. And that's what I'm going to try and emphasize in this talk. So the, uh, the notion that climate controls vegetation emerged out of the wonderful uh, life of Humboldt, a brilliant German biogeographer from the late 18th century who traveled the world, the world's first ecotourist, and had a wonderful time and realized that uh, he saw similar vegetation in similar climate zones. Schimper formalized this idea and a little over a hundred years ago really came up with the, um, the concepts of biomes that we still use today. And he went further, he said that the, um, if you understood the physiology of plants, the particular plants that you found anywhere, like tall trees in a deciduous forest, broadleaf evergreen trees in the tropics, represented the physiological optimum for that environment. And for example, the shrublands that you find in Mediterranean climates are the physiological optimum, the best fit to a climate with uh, wet winters and dry summers. The Mediterranean climate vegetation is shrubby. Shrublands are really common. And here's a little um, table from uh, Keely et al's book. And I've highlighted here in red the fraction of the area that is shrublands. And you'll see that uh, shrublands dominate everywhere with the exception of California. California is weird, it doesn't fit. Uh, the Cape is the norm um, in South Africa with 97% shrublands. And Australia should be 97%, but they don't understand what a woodland is. <laughs> um, I'm going to focus on the Cape, and my apologies for that, but I will try and uh, extend the arguments or the ideas to other regions where I can. So the question that I want to try and deal with in this talk is why do shrublands dominate the vegetation of Mediterranean climate regions? Are they particularly well adapted as a growth form to Mediterranean climates? And does this um, adaptive advantage, this physiological optimum, account for why the Mediterranean regions are covered with shrublands? Or shall we invert the whole thing and say, well, actually, Mediterranean-type shrublands can occur all over the place in a whole range of different climates, but they are outcompeted by other growth forms everywhere else, and the Mediterranean regions reflect a refuge. It's the only place where shrubs can hang out there without being uh, destroyed by competitors. We know very little about shrubs, and I just listed these papers here if you want to follow up on uh, some new ideas on why be a shrub or a trub. Uh, there's some interesting evolutionary arguments which I won't have time to go into. So why shrublands? And I'll start with the classic ideas, climate, and if it's not climate, it must be soils controlling the vegetation. The climate, you know, we all know that the major patterns of world vegetation fit climate, or do they? Along a gradient of uh, rainfall, from high rainfall to low rainfall, we expect to find forests, woodlands, shrublands, grasslands, and then deserts. So where you find shrublands means that you're in a climate that's too dry for trees. And this fits in uh, this data from North America. Along a precipitation gradient, woody biomass increases, biomass increases, um, and we'd expect the shrublands to be somewhere along here. As you get drier, there's, no, there's just not enough shrubs left. This single outlier is where temperature begins to influence things and uh, changes that pattern. This is what it looks like in the Cape. Completely different. There's no increase in woody biomass along the precipitation gradient in the Cape shrublands. Uh, we don't see masses of forest. We don't get giant uh, sequoia forests in those high rainfall areas. It's the same throughout. This is what it looks like. There's a bit of uh, Cape Famos um, at a high rainfall site and uh, there are no forests, it's a shrubland. 
This is another one dominated by proteas, beautiful stuff, um, and there's no forest. Here's you go drier. This is a drier version of famos, and you might think, well, you know, it's too dry for trees. But the farmers have done the experiment here. They planted trees, and trees grow perfectly adequately, although the rainfall is lower here. So uh, most of the Cape, huge areas of Cape Famos, the shrublands, could support forest. So the question arises, of course, how do you know when a climate is wet enough to support a forest? And uh, you can go and look for natural forest patches. It's very hard to do in the Mediterranean basin because there's not much natural left. You can plant trees. It's an experiment. It takes about 10, 20, 30 years to get the results. But, you know, you're young. Start now. Or you can try and model it. And uh, physiologically based models have been developed to explore questions such as how does climate, real climate, day-to-day -day climate, influence the uh, physiognomy of vegetation. And here's an example of output for South Africa using one of these uh, DGVMs, Dynamic Global Vegetation Models. And um, based on the physiological principles, we expect the eastern half of the country to be a forest. These red and purple colors and blue colors indicate high tree cover. And look down here. That's the Mediterranean climate of South Africa. And uh, that region, according to the simulations, should be forest, not shrublands. So is this a poor model? Or are the assumptions used in building the model wrong? Have we got the physiology wrong? You better not tell that to the people who design the models, because they believe in their physiology. If you look harder in the Cape, you will find patches of closed forest. And uh, here they are. These, these are natural bits of forest. And this is where people have planted trees as plantations. And that woody biomass curve increases, just like the North American model. But the natural vegetation, the dominant vegetation, is right down here. So the climate can support forests, but doesn't, in, at least as the dominant vegetation. So all right, if it's not climate, it must be soils. Famous soils are very poor in nutrients, and so does the lack of nutrients mean that forests can't grow there. And where you do study it and you look at the, the nutrients, you find that forests generally occur on much richer soils than uh, adjacent shrublands or indeed grasslands or savannas. Here's some data from a paper of Mike Kramer. And here's the forest versus famous, the shrubland vegetation. And if you look at the calcium there, that's 9.8 units versus 0.6. Massive difference. 15 versus 5 for uh, total cations. Phosphorus, the obsession of nutrient people, 22.5 versus 4.8. Clearly, the forests require nutrient-rich soils to grow there. The trouble is that both the forest and the famous are growing on the same geology. They had the same starting condition, the same miserable, awful quartzitic soils. The only interpretation you can make is that the vegetation constructed these nutrients from what was available in terms of the geology. It's not the cause of the forest, it's the consequence of the forest being there. Are very embarrassing. <coughs> so um, do forests require richer soils, or are the soils a consequence of having forests growing on them? And the trouble with correlative studies, particularly by ecologists, is that they completely ca confound cause and effect. And the reason is ecologists sample, if you're sampling soil, you sample the top 30 centimeters. That is exactly the layer of soil most influenced by the vegetation itself. So my golly, here's a forest that's got richer soil. The interpretation should be it's because the forests are enriching the soil. And we know plants can profoundly alter soils. So you need to be very careful to attribute vegetation pattern to soils, uh, and especially soil nutrients. So how do you get beyond the correlation? And uh, why, anyway, should low nutrients prevent forest formation? The same idea, by the way, is very prominent in South America and, and indeed parts of Australia, that low nutrient soils 
prevent forests from forming. I couldn't find anybody who provided explanations, so I invented a terrible one just to irritate the people who really know about the topic enough for them to start coming up with an idea. And perhaps I can irritate you as well to come up with a better idea. So this is a nutrient stock argument, right? And uh, what I wanted to know was how much nutrients do you need in the soil to produce a forest? And you start by saying, well, if you're a grassland or a shrubland, you need enough nutrients to make the leaves, the foliage. If you're a forest, what's the difference? Well, the foliage is stuck on the top of a big pole. Um, the foliage, the actual foliage that forests have is not that different from a grassland or a shrubland. The real difference in the nutrient requirement is to build the wood. And the nutrient concentration of wood is low, but there's an awful lot of wood. So you end up requiring a lot of nutrients just to, that get stuck in the wood, particularly calcium, for example, because it's used in the cell walls, which then form part of the wood. So the main thing that you need if you're going to have a forest is uh, nutrients that get locked in the wood. So given that reasoning, you can work out how much nutrients you need in the soil to grow a forest. So this is the biomass that we're looking for. And I had a threshold biomass for a low forest and a higher biomass for a medium forest. And then I asked um, the, each of these uh, um, points here reflects a different soil type. And these soil types here didn't have enough calcium in them to produce enough wood to make a forest. And the same here with potassium. All of these sites didn't have enough potassium in them to grow the wood to make a forest. But you know, that was an ecological sampling down to 30 centimeters. All you needed to do was to go to a meter depth and then all the soils that I looked at had sufficient nutrients to grow a forest. Uh, all that's happening is that the trees are exploiting a larger volume of soil with more nutrients, and then you can build a forest. So uh, how disappointing. Nutrients did not account for the absence of forests on nutrient-poor soils. And famous soils certainly have enough nutrient stock, according to this argument, to grow a forest. If the soils are deep enough, and where the soils are shallow, and there isn't enough nutrients to build all that wood, there are other constraints anyway. The trees run out of water, so you can't build a forest. Surely there's some better alternatives to the nutrient stock hypothesis. And the best one out there comes from uh, Kalman, way back in the 1980s, and he said, low nutrient soils cause slow tree growth. And in the presence of a disturbance, and he said fire, this is why I like his hypothesis, the trees recover too slowly between successive fires to close over and form a forest. So the association between forest and nutrient-rich soils is a matter of the interaction between growth rates and fire or a disturbance like it. If you have any other ideas, please, let's uh, talk about them at this meeting and I'll try and shoot them down. So what are the biotic hypotheses for the dominance of shrubland? Well, these are the ones I'm going to talk about. Uh, light, consumer control, and soil modification. Trees and light, the fundamental principle underlying Clemensian succession is competition for light being asymmetrical. If you're tall, then the guys underneath you uh, are shaded out. So the tallest plants that cast the most shade should dominate any, any system. And therefore, if there's su sufficient rainfall, you expect forests to grow because at equilibrium, nothing else can beat them. Trees that don't shade out the understory, including the saplings of more shade-tolerant trees, are vulnerable to invasion by shade-tolerant trees that could then come in and take them out. So if you find shade intolerant plants, shrubby plants, all over the place, and this is the classic interpretation in the Mediterranean basin, because of disturbance, because people have chopped down the forest, and the result is that you have these shade intolerant things growing underneath them. Well, 
This is the early successional flora in the Cape. The stuff that grows where forests should grow. This is the proteus. This is the uh, sample of the 600 species of ericas. Tiny leaves, tiny growth forms. They hate the shade. They are hardwired to their architecture. The leaves have no plasticity to deal with shade, and they're all eliminated if you put shade on top of them. These are all the non-ericas, also ericoid plants. There are hundreds of them, thousands of them, and they're also extremely intolerant of shade. It's ridiculous to call this vegetation early successional, with thousands of endemic species, the richest temperate flora in the world. And how can we use the word early successional, inherited from the Europeans, looking with dismay at the Mediterranean vegetation and saying, what would it have looked like if people haven't chopped all these forests down? People have not chopped the forest down in the Cape, and yet we have early successional vegetation that's been there for millions of years. It's a bit ridiculous. Eh? Even the restios, the graminoids, hate the shade and disappear if you shade them out in your garden or anywhere else. The same with the geophytes. They're so intolerant of shade that they only emerge after fires when there's enough light to support them. This is what a forest looks like in the Cape. This is what the, the way it should work, where the uh, most shade-tolerant species win. And look at the understory. There's nothing there. There's not a famous plant to be seen. They all hate the shade. There's some exceptions, and one of the biggest exceptions is the places where trees don't cast any shade. And of course, you'll recognize this, it's eucalypts. Terrible plants to try and have lunch under in the middle of the day because they don't cast any shade. And the consequence is that in the understory of eucalypts is famous shade-hating shrubs. Um, so, <coughs> in Australia, what people call woodlands in Australia are, is just a famous with overgrown trees. It's a shrubland with overgrown trees and nothing more. I'd love to know more about the uh, uh, Californian situation because uh, many of the pines also allow enormous amount of light through the canopy and support shade intolerant species in the understory. And that's an anomaly. It's a freak. It shouldn't happen that way. If it does happen that way, it means succession is not progressing to those species that can capture all the light. There's an anomaly. So why on earth do you have a shade intolerant understory underneath really tall trees? Something is preventing those communities from being invaded by more shade tolerant trees. So we can ask, it, it now points to light. There are remarkably few studies of light in the Cape, but we can look at floristic turnover in response to light gradients. And we've done that recently, comparing generic uh, 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 floristic turnover across the various biome boundaries in South Africa. And the prediction was that the biggest floristic turnover would be where the biomes went to different light environments, where one side was an open system with lots of light, and the other side was a forest system where the light is captured by the tallest trees. And uh, we predicted that those would be the ones with the largest floristic turnover, and we could look at a whole range of other environmental variables to see how they influenced how much floristic turnover you got from one biome to the next. And I'm not sure how well you could read this pretty badly, I expect, but this is the relative contribution of the different variables to floristic turnover. And at the top there is leaf area index, which is our surrogate for shade. So our prediction was correct, where the big differences between biomes are in terms of light, we get the biggest floristic turnover. And the next most important factor was fire. And just the occurrence of fire, rather than the frequency of fire. If you had a system that burnt and a system that didn't, they also showed really large differences in the flora as represented by uh, genera and families. This is another way of uh, reflecting this. Each of these points represents a different sample of um, a biome boundary. And uh, the dark points here with the error bars 
indicate the average for a particular uh, set of pair of biomes. And what you see is where the contrast and leaf area index, the contrast in shade is the greatest, we have the highest turnover, floristic turnover. So light is the big issue here. I don't know how much people know about light in the Mediterranean basin, but the really species rich uh, systems that I've seen have been full of light and the really boring species poor uh, parts have been those where the trees are shading everything out, where you've reached some sort of um, equilibrium with climate. There have been remarkably few studies uh, of the evolutionary consequences of changing from a shaded environment to uh, a well-lit environment. The only one study I know of in the Cape by Onstein and Peter Linder and others. And um, what they could find, they could only find transitions, evolutionary transitions from forest to fables, from shaded to open environments, but no reversals. So it's a permanent life sentence. If you get into that light environment, it's very difficult to go back again into the forest. And when you do move into the light environment, there's this burst of speciation. The speciation is associated with small shrubby systems with lots of light and not with shaded forested environments. Why are the Mediterranean regions so rich in species? Because they are shrubland and not uh, boring old forest where everything is the same. Sorry, my apologies to tropical rainforest guys. And they showed a big trait shift uh, as well to smaller leaves from the forest into light and a change in SLA. So here's one example in the Peniaceae. These are the forest elements here. And this is what happens when they jump into the famous, get out of the shade and into the sunlight. Uh, great burst of speciation. And this is the time scale here. So somewhere within the last 10 million years is when this transition happened or earlier, depending on how you uh, count your, your phylogenetic patterns. Certainly not early successional in the sense of a human impact on forests. These transitions to a non-forested environment happened millions of years ago. This is another example. This is Rutaceae and the subfamily Diosmii. There's just one member of this clade in forests, and this is what happened when it jumped out of the forest and into the sunlight. This uh, massive speciation producing large numbers of species. Uh, and this happened much earlier. This happened on the order of uh, 20 million years or more. The dating here is pretty uncertain. The point is that uh, these systems are millions of years old, not just a few thousand reflecting uh, human impact. In terms of the traits, changes, these dark points here are the forests. Um, Forest clades and these here, the, the open uh, symbols are famous. And what you see at the top end where the forests are, are large leaves on this axis going into the famous where the smaller leaves evolve. So the consequence of going into the sunlight is smaller leaves. Another consequence is to go from thin leaves to thick leaves, um, which we are familiar with, but this is happening um, an interesting data, an interesting uh, study of looking at what happens when forest clades go into shrublands. So what on earth um, gets rid of the trees anyway and allows uh, shrubs to take over if it's not climate and it's not soils? I call them consumers and um, this is what the climate potential allows you and this is what you actually see and the difference is very often due to what you can call consumer control, things that consume biomass. Not always. Sometimes the soils, the physical constraints are such that forests can't grow. But there's a huge uh, a gap here, which is often caused by these consumers. There's a big consumer. How often do you consider these guys? I mean, really, dinosaurs must have had a massive impact troggling down the Cretaceous landscapes, just leaning against a tree by mistake and you're going to smash it down. And then, you know, that was a long time ago, but much more recent, in Los Angeles, right close to UCLA, 
you had these guys in the last 10,000 to 40,000 years. And uh, this is what um, Southern California looked like, at least in the foothills, according to the fossils in the La Brea tar pits. And of course, the same was true of the Mediterranean Basin. They had lots of big animals moving around. How much have we thought about those? And they had lots of small animals, caprids, goats, and sheep, uh, multiple species chewing through the landscape. If you look at goats now, uh, they just are fortunate relics of the Pleistocene. How lucky you are to have them. Put some more on the land and see what happens. I know that it's, it's considered overgrazed or degraded. Or is it? Or is it just a reflection of lost Pleistocene landscape? In the Famos, we still have uh, in Africa the megafauna. And uh, Famos is revolting for animals. They don't eat it. They don't like chewing it. And uh, the big difference that we have between the potential biomass and the actual biomass is to do with the other major consumer, fire. And uh, those massive differences are due to this particular herbivore munching through plants. This is what it looks like. This is a, a, a famous landscape. In the foreground, burnt famous, and on the side here, and you can see here dead proteoid shrubs. Uh, that are non-sprouters killed by the fire. And here's the forest, unburnt in this fire. And you've got to reflect here that this is the same climate, the same geology, with utterly different biomes staring at each other, behaving completely differently. And the fire goes out when it hits the forest. So to Ecologists are moving away from this idea of early successional vegetation if it's been around for a million years and instead talking about alternative biome states. And the idea is you have the same physical starting condition, the same climate, the same geology, but the biological assemblages can diverge from those same starting conditions. And the biological assemblages create their own environmental conditions that can perpetuate strikingly different assemblages. So for example, you can evolve traits that promote fire or that promote browsing and that results in open vegetation. Or you can promote traits that exclude fire uh, and reduce browsing in forests. There are positive feedbacks on the nutrient cycle. So get away from the idea that soils deliver nutrients to plants. Plants deliver nutrients to soils. The feedback and positive feedbacks on those resources can completely alter resource availability. So the same starting condition, same geology, very different results. So the environmental conditions created by plants can supersede these uh, deterministic notions that physical constraints determine what you see. The ideas of uh, Humboldt and Schimper, the climate rules, uh, don't, don't um, believe them. <laughs> Believe me, it's true. <laughs> so here's uh, just after a fire. It was literally smoking when we arrived. And this is the fame was that burnt, a very intense burn. There were no firefighters here. The fire stopped because of the shift in fuel conditions. Uh, the fame was burnt, burnt into a meter or two of the forest and then went out. This is what it looks like in a landscape context. Uh, the fire roared through and hit the edge of the forest there and went out. So you can see there's some t topographic influences uh, impacting the fire there as well. The remarkable thing is the differences between these two systems are profound. They differ in multiple ways. Light response, leaf size, flammability, the fruit and dispersal modes, nutrient acquisition, uh, just by walking across two meters from one boundary to another. There's deep phylogenetic conservatism within each of these biomes. Uh, forest clades, Kidoniaceae, Ebonaceae, and so on, that are restricted to these forest patches, and the cape clades that are restricted to the flammable famos. This divide, a meter or two wide, is as profound, if not more profound, than the Atlantic Ocean. The Southern Atlantic seems to be really wide, but you know there's more transfers across that line than there is in this ecological boundary between two different biomes. I'm stretching things a little bit, but uh, making a point.
This is a profound difference and is controlled by the ecology, intracontinental uh, vicariates. We've looked at flammability. The uh, evolution of flammability is a complex story. Um, but what we can do nowadays, we can, we can uh, measure flammability in a reasonable way. And the way you do it, this might look like a barbecue, and it is very much like a barbecue. You put your plant on there and you ignite it and it burns. And that's the way uh, nature burns. It's much closer to the way nature burns a shrub than pulling off little leaves and putting them in a highly controlled laboratory circumstance. You need the whole structure to get an idea of how it responds to fire. And uh, this just shows the results in terms of the percent of fuel burned for a sample from a, a one area of Famos. And in that area of Famos, there were also forest elements. The forest elements have no post-burn recruitment. They would be what John Keeley would call obligate sprouters. Um, they are obligate sprouters, and they have shown no post-burn recruitment. And here's the contrast with Famos elements that um, might sprout, they might not sprout, but they all have seedlings after a fire. And you can see the difference in flammability, with the forest elements much less flammable than the famous elements uh, in general. And the contributors to um, flammability that we found in our sample was percent fine fuel, so small leaf things, lots of fine fuel, and we saw that this is a major functional change when plants move out of a forest and evolve into a high light environment. And also a uh, major contributor was percent dead fuel, which is uh, a more tricky thing to attribute to um, moving into a light environment. So the uh, third biotic uh, interaction is soil modification. I'm not going to say very much about this because I don't know very much. But Famos thrives on miserable soils. And Cape Mountains, according to a paper that came out a few years ago, holds the world record for the slowest weathering rates, 100 times slower than the weathering of the Alps, the Andes, or Tibet. Uh, and because of that slow weathering, the soils are pretty, pretty grim. And the, uh, according to some data, sandy Famos soils have the lowest phosphorus contents. I know that Australians disagree, especially Hans Lumbers, but uh, if you look at the numbers, South African famous soils are really miserable. And uh, plants have evolved diverse rooting systems to access and mine the nutrients available. And these are pictures of these wonderful cluster roots that have evolved in these systems from a paper from uh, Hans Lumbers. Um, and they occur in uh, diverse groups, proteas, restios, cyperaceae, uh, brilliant way of, of accessing um, hard to get phosphorus. But uh, you've got to av avoid the conclusion that they have evolved uh, these strategies as the only solution for these geologies, because they haven't. On the same substrate, Different biomes occur with completely different nutrient acquisition strategies. And uh, I have, um, I'm going to, we have written about this in a paper published uh, a year or so ago. So I think that uh, famous plants create their own misery in terms of nutrients. Um, and this is the question that needs pursuing. Do famous plants help create very nutrient-poor soils? Through slow nutrient cycling, um, thick, coarse leaves that, that decompose slowly, a sunlit environment where the humidity is much lower to drive decomposition, very conservative nutrient use, so the nutrient quality of the leaves is very poor. And um, the consequence of this, if they do drive the nutrients down, would be much slower growth of forest species and consequently a reduction in the rates at which forests can colonize famous, protecting the shade intolerant plants until a fire comes along and opens up the environment. 
So I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures of what it looks like in there. We have these mountains covered with fame moss, but there's a huge patch of, of, of forest, well, a huge, tiny patch. You can't map it on, on anything other than a 1 in 50,000 map, and even there it's hard to see. But when you're on the ground, you'll see them. And it's the same slope, same geology, same climate, but this utterly different system. Here I was convinced that this patch of, uh, of, stink of um, side rocks on woodland must be on a different soil, but it turned out to be exactly the same soil as the Fambos, deep aeolian dune sands. The plants are constructing their own environment. So cave shrubs are not forests because they're highly flammable and burn. The fires are intense, they crown fires, they occur at uh, decadal or multi-decadal intervals. The fire regime that they have is a consequence of Mediterranean climates which allow uh, productivity when it's wet and allow fires to burn when it's dry. They generate and maintain a low nutrient soil system and work done by Pat Mann as many years ago shows that the nutrients slow forest colonization. Uh, there's active work at the moment from a Princeton group uh, working with my colleagues at UCT uh, on this whole system to look at the interaction between fire and um, nutrient manipulation by plants to test uh, this hypothesis. I think famous can also grow because they're shallow-rooted, shrubs are shallow-rooted. They can grow on shallow, rocky soils that might be uh, impossible for forest trees to grow on. So there are physical refugia, there are direct uh, physical controls on where forests can grow. And this might be where these shrubby systems uh, persisted in times that were hostile for them and more favorable for forests. So if these patterns are general, then the key contributor to famous diversity was the replacement of forest. Uh, and associated closed vegetation by the shrubland. And I would like to just make the point that it shouldn't be called uh, Ockbill, but Fockbill. Uh, and Fockbill meaning flammable, old, climatically buffered, infertile landscape. So apologies to Steve Hopper, but uh, he, he seems to be a persistent uh, reluctance by some Australians to acknowledge the importance of fire and the evolution of their flora, which I find unbelievable. Anyway, let's start calling them Fockbull, and then I'll be happy. <laughs> you first have to have a fire-resistant forest replaced by a fire-promoting shrubland for the shade-intolerant, highly diverse floras to evolve. Uh, this, I reckon... Well, I'd like to um, end, start ending this talk. I've been working in grasslands for the last quite a long time now, and the question does rise. Uh, grasslands also open ecosystems, like Fambos. Why is Fambos shrubby and not grassy? Africa is the grassiest continent. South Africa is overwhelmingly grassy. And uh, all right, fair enough, it's not forest, but... Um, What we see in, in South Africa is uh, rainfall seasonality, where the rain is primarily in the summer rainfall, in, during the summer over here, and here we get increasing rain in the winter. So these are the winter rainfall uh, systems which support these shrubby systems. And this stuff here is weird, and we don't know what's going on. So basically, the summer rainfall areas support grassy biomes, and those grasslands are dominated by C4 grasses, uh, unlike um, here in Spain, in the Desunias with the uh, Quercusuba, and then as you cross into the more winter rainfall areas, it switches to the shrubland biomes with C3 grasses. So the question is, um, let me show you some pictures. This is what a C4 grassy area looks like. This is not arid doesn't fit the American model. This is the high, some of the highest rainfall areas in the country, and they should be huge, tall forests, and they're not, they're grasslands. And this fire here 
is part of the reason why. We know that they can be forests because you find forest patches in them. The striking differences between the forests and the grassy biomes next door, this here, by the way, is, uh, is uh, Savannah protea. You just think of proteas as being in uh, famous plants, but they also grow in summer rainfall savanna systems. And the differences in the floras are profound. Here's the forest understory, and it just eliminates all these shade intolerant species. We used to think that uh, it was all forest, and then people came along and uh, farmed it and uh, cut the forests away. We now know, in a mosaic like this, that the forests are the newcomers and the grasslands are ancient using carbon isotopes. So if you look at the soils underneath these forests, you'll find that they have the isotopic signal of grassland. So we got the idea completely wrong. Completely and absolutely wrong. The public still believes this idea. Scientists are way beyond there. It's the fun about science is that we change our minds because of evidence. Uh, this is where shrublands could grow. And this is the idea that uh, shrubs find a refuge in winter rainfall climates where there are no grasses. If you stop burning, famous-like shrubs invade these grasslands and eventually they turn into forests of tall trees. This is a classic experiment where suppress the fires and this grassland turns into what we would call famous, uh, a shrubland. The shrublands are not designed for Mediterranean climates. They're designed for any old climate, but they really aren't designed for competition with C4 grasses. So the worrying thing is, what would happen if the grasslands began to move into the winter rainfall regions? And I heard, first heard this from Ross Bradstock at the Medicos in Perth, where he said, you know, the worrying thing would be if these awful C4 grasses started invading the beautiful Mediterranean systems of southwestern Australia. And that's bugged me, and I'm now worried about whether uh, C4 grasses may not start moving into the Cape. And uh, unfortunately, they're doing so. This is a famous system which has been invaded by C4 grasses. That's what it looks like before invasion. This is an area invaded by C4 grasses with uh, Ed February and, and, and Tavia Munya who are working with me on this system. And that right next door is what famous should look like. These grasses are intensely competitive and they suppress all the seedlings um, of the shrubby system. I'd love to know what happens in the Quercus Suba grassy systems in Spain and whether the grasses are also highly competitive here and if so, why grasslands don't dominate more of the Mediterranean. The soils are very poor in nutrients, so they're not, uh, they haven't proved to be a barrier at all to grass invasion. For those of you who know soils, this is a pod soil, uh, very nutrient poor. This is not quite as nutrient poor. And these are the guys. They look as though they're working hard, but actually these soils are very easy to dig because they're so sandy. Um, this is the isotopic signal down these grass patches versus famous sites next door. And what this tells us is that this is a new invasion. If it was an old invasion, we'd find a C4 grassy signal all the way down the profile. So this is new. It's happening right now. Um, and my feeling is that we need to understand why are these shrubby systems not grassy? I think I'm pretty clear on why they're not forested but I'm much less clear why they're not grassy. And it seems to me that there's a potential for native invasion of shrublands by C4 grasses and that there are places where it's actually happening. So I want to conclude now by uh, saying that um, the earliest Medicos meetings that Phil Rundle was talking about was about climate and how climate was the main factor causing convergence of the different Mediterranean systems influencing vegetation. Then there was a meeting about soil nutrients where Ray Specht, Fred Kruger, Eugene Moll got together and said, we've got to separate the Cape and Australian systems because it's extremely nutrient poor and the nutrients are determining how the vegetation looks. Then we had meetings which said, no, nah, it's all about fire. Fire is the issue and uh, fire is determining the real convergence of Mediterranean systems 
is because they share similar fire regimes, partly as a consequence of climate. I suggest that what we need to start looking at is this really interesting realm of biotic interactions along with uh, the physical constraints. The uh, interactions between climate and soil nutrients and, um, and soil nutrients and vegetation and vegetation on soil nutrients and climate controlling vegetation and vegetation influencing climate although the Mediterranean system is probably too small for that to happen and the mutual interaction between fire and vegetation and particularly here in the Mediterranean Basin in California, I'd love to hear some talks about the role of the fauna, the large mammals, in constructing Mediterranean vegetation. I have some ideas, but not enough time to talk about them. And then all of this rather co more complicated system is constrained within the realm of us, of people, in the time of the Anthropocene. And we can really get it fundamentally wrong uh, if you think climate controls everything, then you'll think it should be forests and you'll support European policies to grow forests all over our extremely rich Mediterranean floras because forests are the right thing for this climate. They couldn't be more wrong. We need to understand our systems far better uh, to ensure that we do manage them reasonably and correctly into the future. Thanks very much. The fortunate thing is that if people do have questions, I won't be able to hear them. And if I do hear them, I might not be able to understand them, especially with people with a Californian accent. <laughs> John. You have, the, you have forest and fainbow starting out on the same substrates, and then the forest soils accumulate more nutrients. Clearly, the forests aren't creating those nutrients. So I assume the argument is what forests do is they transport nutrients from deep soil layers to shallow layers? Yes, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Okay. There's some nice examples of uh, invasive Australian acacias, which have uh, dramatically boosted topsoil nutrients. Um, through exploring a deeper soil volume, so increasing phosphorus in the soil surface and then completely uh, transforming the, the, the nutrients, the nitrogen content of the soil, uh, partly because they were in legumes, fixing nitrogen, but primarily because they generate huge amounts of foliage relative to the famous. Over there. William, I know you've been to Chile, and central Chile has no evolutionary history of fire since the Miocene. And yet now, if anybody's been following the news in the last few weeks, there's been catastrophic fires in many parts of Chile right now. What do you think about that might in the long term have an impact? What's burning our forest types, uh, particularly? Um, well, it's going to be, from a scientific point of view, a very interesting case study. And uh, the, um, if, if, the, if the forests have burnt, um, the re-sprouting ability of forests is often attributed to exposure to fire in the past. But it could also be exposure to large mammals. Uh, so if Chile had a history of large mammals like giant sloths and so on, then uh, they might recover from sprouting. And it would be very interesting to see if that happens. I think it's a, it's a disaster for Chile, and the, uh, the main problem that I saw in Chile was the lack of post-burn recruitment, um, except for a handful of, of species. So it could be quite transformative. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, William. Um, why have you got this preoccupation with large mammals? Uh, if you've got very small creatures and lots of them, they can eat a lot too. Termites might be interesting. Um, termites will shorten the life. Uh, the, from what we can see, and we have analyzed it, you can have a look at, we've got a recent paper in PNAS, which is a beauty, <coughs> I hate to uh, market the thing, on uh, the role of mammals in the, in the spread of savannas in Africa. And uh, it turns out that the smaller animals were more influential than the large ones, but it was the mammals. And the, uh, the smaller mammals, which browse on saplings and seedlings, turn out to have much more impact on the physiognomy, on a, the chance of a forest forming, than elephants smashing around. Elephants happily coexisted with forests for millions of years, but when the small browsing animals arrived in Africa, uh, they, were trans they transformed the place into open systems. Termites, um, I don't, uh, I have to find out more about your reasoning. Termites are certainly important um, in terms of uh, being able to digest wood and uh, concentrate nutrients into their mounds. But tell me more. We better talk about it later. I think insects in general don't matter. And the, <laughs> and the reason, I, I, there is a reason for it. I won't go into the reasoning now. The big mammals, the big vertebrates, those are the ones that count. I think it's And what about bacteria? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't catch it. What, what about bacteria? Bacteria. Um, I think that the uh, soil microbial uh, system is, is, is really, uh, could be really important as an additional feedback, uh, which slows the, trans, the, trans, the transition from one biome to another. And we know very little about it. Uh, there have been hardly any uh, experimental studies, but um, uh, I think that that could really be very important in inhibiting, for example, forests from moving into um, famous, into shrubland environments. And I'd love to see more work on that. I think it looks like drinks time. <laughs> So excuse the California accent. Um, so the argument about nutrients, you probably know more about California nutrients than I do, but we don't think of the, far, I, don't think, I don't think of the shrubland and forest as being enormously distinct. So is, is the nutrient just trying to say that it's not a conclusive argument in these low nutrient systems, or is the California system somehow not? What's the relevance of our higher nutrient, higher fertility, more eroding systems to how you're constructing your argument, I guess, is what I'm... No, I think you, you got it right, that the, um, the nutrient argument has been used to explain the, the, uh, the lack of forests in uh, particularly nutrient-poor environments, such as the uh, Cerrado of South America or uh, the Famous. And um, to some degree, it's also prominent in, in Australia, uh, but there it's, it's more complicated because you're comparing sclerophyll, which means eucalypts, versus so-called rainforest uh, with a nutrient control. And I think the nutrients have been exaggerated. In the uh, California situation, in most of the northern hemisphere, uh, it seems to me that nutrients are a minor cause of, of major vegetation patterns, except where the plants manipulate it. And the most interesting example of manipulation of nutrients that I've come across is the boreal forest. Boreal forest should be covered with angiosperms, but they're not. Uh, those ruddy the spruce and so on seem to be able to manipulate the system to exclude uh, the angiosperms. So there's still interesting stories to be explored there. Uh, we've always thought of it as a, as a cold, um, a cold design system, but it could well be uh, manipulation again of biochronicles of nutrients within a climate context. I'm happy. 
happy to end it here. <laughs> One moment, please. The welcome reception is at a hotel, which is 15 minutes walking distance from here. So if somebody is interested at half past seven, we'll meet in front of the registration. So there will be staff that could go with you to the hotel. <laughs>